we have two. They all missing. Uh, hey everyone. Uh, hey Andre, we are so excited too. Thank you for joining us. Audience, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm so excited about this event with you. I was talking with the speakers uh, backstage, and the key takeaways you're gonna get from this are just amazing. Um, my name is Eduardo. I am a uh, events manager here at Modern Sales Pros, and we are here today to talk about how to master all the channels of communication, um, which is a very great topic. We have the brightest minds in the business here with me today. So feel free, audience, feel free to go into the chat and share with us where you're turning in from in the chat because we love to see the global footprint of our elite community. I see some people in there already saying some things. Um, is my audio OK? I had some problems earlier. Everyone can hear me fine. Awesome. Uh, so as I said, my name is Eduardo. I am a marketing manager here at Modern Sales Pros. And for those of you not familiar with Modern Sales Pros, we are the largest and finest community for more than 35,000 members. Can you imagine that? Uh, we have me uh, our members are all in sales management, uh, leadership, operations, and enablement. And we are all about taking the road less travel and bring you along for the journey. Uh, our mission is to help you tackle tough questions and discover opportunities um, you might not even know exist. We do this through vibrant live sessions like this one you're about to experience. We have an engaging online forum and our most attend uh, summits every quarter. Uh, and we also have a bunch of in-person events nationwide. So keep an eye out for our uh, in-person events if you go into our website. Uh, I see people from Houston, Texas. We are coming to Austin in two weeks. Uh, Ali is in Austin. I see people from Chicago. I'm coming to Chicago next week. So we all have uh, events across the country. Um, if you're not a member of MSP yet, you will receive an invitation right after this event. So keep an eye out. Um, OK, but let's focus on how to get the most out of this event. Please uh, use the Q&A panel. I see people are interacting in there. Ariana will give you guys some prompts for you to go into the chat and uh, let us know what you want to hear from the speakers. And also, this panel is being recorded. We could not leave the, all this knowledge that the speakers will drop on you today go to the ether. So we are recording this and you will receive an email later today from me with uh, the recording and the key takeaways from this panel. One thing I didn't mention about Modern Sales Pros is that we have the best partners ever. And today we have Sales Intel as our partner. Uh, I have Ariana here with me. So Ariana, can you let us know what Sales Intel is all about while I change my presentation to the next one? Yeah, of course, Eduardo. Thanks for having us. We love being here as a sponsor of the Modern Sales Pros community because that's what we want to do. We want to help our community. We want to help and impact. And we do this in four simple steps. I could tell you guys for, for everything, but there's four things you need to remember about Sales Intel. We help you target the right accounts with the best B2B data intelligence in, uh, possible. We help you know who's in market, so who you should be talking to at those accounts, getting the right people at those accounts, but then also making up all of the difference by making sure you have that human verified element and support. Because I know it's one thing for a data provider to show up and say, hey, everyone, we've got the best data. That sounds like old news, but we actually go the extra mile and make sure that you have the data that you need through our customer service and through our research on demand. So that is how we are different from others that you may have seen in the space. But enough about us. We are not here to talk about us today. We are here to talk about mastering omni-channel sales, all about balancing creativity and efficiency across your platforms. Uh, I'm going to be your MC, Ariana Shannon, Director of Marketing here at Sales Intel. And I have with us uh, the fabulous Samantha, Dale, and Jeremiah. So Dale, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Give us 10 seconds on yourself and why uh, you are passionate about this topic. Dale Dupree, founder and leader of the Sales Rebellion changing the face of sales entirely, one sales rep at a time. I'm passionate about this topic because I feel it's extremely important that we start changing the way that we look at the landscape of sales and this is where it all begins. Awesome. All right, Sam, give us a little intro. I know who you are, but tell everyone else. <laughs> Hi, I'm Sam. I'm a manager here at Sales Intel. I'm really passionate about this topic because I spent about 10 years as an IC. So I was doing it all, it was really hard. And now I'm honored to lead a team. So I know the challenges. I know it's always a balance, right? So uh, I'm really excited to dive in with Dale and Jeremiah on this. 
Awesome. And then of course we have last but not least, Jeremiah, come off mute and tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, Jeremiah Griffin, head of sales at the Sales Rebellion. Only 10 seconds, huh? So I would say that I'm passionate about this topic because I think there's a lot of uh, confusion about uh, about this topic. Uh, so maybe dispelling some uh, some confusion and, and notions that people might have around that, um, and uh, you know, explaining why it's important to uh, to be creative um, along with your efficiency. So. Awesome. Well, thank you all so much for being here. And we're going to take a little bit of a different approach to this because everyone, we were sitting here thinking about what is the best way to talk through this concept? Um, what can we do to make it really clear and how you're balancing efficiency and creativity? And looking at a bunch of slides is not so fun. So we've actually turned this into a fun little game. So we are going to be looking at all of the different ways that we can, uh, or all of the different channels and options that sales professionals have as an option to them. So Eduardo, if you wouldn't mind just flashing that up real quick so everyone can see them uh, a little bit more clearly, and then we'll go back into this edit mode. So the nine that we had talked through are tiering your named accounts, phone calls, no surprise that's on there, emails, social selling community, direct mail, personal brand and content for you, the seller or your team, this is a very hot topic right now, hyper-personalization, gifting, and then video messages. And what we're gonna do is I'm gonna ask all of our uh, experts here to rank these. So we're looking at what is efficient and how creative can you be while you're doing it? Because it has to go hand in hand. You gotta be creative and stand out, but not so much so that you can't actually meet all of the activity and pipeline requirements that are needed for you. So in the chat, if you guys wouldn't mind, let me know which of those nine items you want us to dig into first. Um, do you guys wanna hear about social selling? Do you wanna hear about personal brand? Do you really wanna know about gifting? I know we've got some great stories around direct mail and gifting for certain. So let me know. Okay, thank you, Andre. I got a gifting or personalization. And while everyone's letting us know, Sam, why don't you go ahead and start us off with tiered accounts? Because I think that there's a reason I put that one in the first block, because I think it really helps set up the rest of the conversation. So give us a look there. Yeah, absolutely. So I think tiering named accounts is probably one of the least creative things that you have to do as a seller, uh, but it's going to make the time to be more creative in really every other type of outbound strategy we're going to talk about. So Ariana, if you could go ahead and put that all the way up at the top for least creative, but helping you be most efficient uh, in your outbound efforts. Jeremiah, Dale, agree, disagree? Yeah, agreed. I mean, it's the it's the first step, right? You have to know who you're reaching out to and uh, and and have a good list that you're working with. Uh, you need really good data, um, and you're not going to spend the same amount of time on uh, on large account or on small accounts as you would large accounts. It's just the you know the nature of of how it works. So, I'd agree with that. Yeah, I agree with it too. I would add a caveat of like understanding and always keeping in mind that. This is about people, it's about serving people. So if we're looking at these lists, these tiered lists as like organizations and ultimately opportunity, I would just challenge that narrative and remind everybody in here that, you know, you're selling to human beings and they're extremely important people. And so you should, in the tiering process, you should be thinking about treating everybody very diligently with good stewardship and excellence and all the same. But understanding also that something like a, a major account is going to take much more time to win and earn their business, to win and earn their trust, as opposed to something like down the street business. The other thing that I would say to this is that when I sold copy machines, which is the most boring thing in the world to sell, what I would do is kind of fantasize about for myself about like, what kind of cool accounts could I actually serve? And then I turned that into reality and you know sold people like Hard Rock Cafes internationally and NASA, some of the, like the coolest organizations out there. And so like inside of like this tiering system, like double click a few times on some of these people, some of their organizations, their products, like what they do and like have a little bit of fun and like add some fruit to the most boring part of <laughs> your sales interactions internally as well. No, absolutely. Well, I'm sure we'll have some great conversation in here, but I don't, I'm not surprised that everyone's agrees. Yes, you should tier your accounts. 
because it helps you understand where you need to be spending the majority of your time while you're talking to the people. Because again, I love the points you guys made. You're selling to the people. You need to be personable. Um, all right, we saw this one come through. Let's talk. Let's talk about direct mail and gifting next. Let's go ahead and just dive straight into that one. We got a couple of people asking about it. Firstly, um, what what are we calling the difference here between direct mail and gifting? Why don't you guys share that with the audience? Yeah, I can jump into that one. Uh, so gifting, um, you know, they're, they're similar, right? Uh, gifting is, is not always going to be a, a direct mail thing. Uh, we know there are platforms out there where you can gift without it being physical mail. Um, but a lot of times it is. Uh, so the difference to us is that uh, gifting is, I mean, is simply that, you know, you're giving someone a gift. Um, and so it's not, you know, with the expectation of something in return, because uh, that's not what a gift is, right? Um, and, and really, we don't do anything with, uh, you know, with the expectation that someone owes us something. Uh, but direct mail, the way that uh, that I look at that is uh, we use direct mail a lot of the rebellion as an attention getting uh, device, you know, not not gimmicky or anything like that. But uh, but we create emotional context through the pieces that we send. Uh, we create some uh, some relevance. Uh, we use humor a lot. And so there's there's a lot of things that go into uh, a good, effective direct mail piece, but the intention is, of course, to break through the noise, uh, to uh, to make a connection with someone, um, and it's just it's a it's different from gifting in that in that regard. I think so then, the, where would you put it? Oh, sorry, Dale, I'm go so ahead. Sorry, I did not want to interrupt you, so you please <laughs> go ahead. I was just going to ask. Where do you rank it? So maybe you can answer that one for me. Where does this go on the tier? Also, my apologies. If you guys are not familiar with this, S tier means like superior, the best. F tier means you failed miserably. So that's kind of the scale that we're working on there. So Dale, where where would you put direct mail on the scale? Yeah, I mean, for so for me, it's it's like it's above the S, quite frankly. And and the reason that it is is because I spent again, I spent here I go bragging about my copier walk again. I spent 13 years selling copy machines at, at the same company. Uh, I only had two companies that I ever uh, uh, worked with. I was with, with one at, for 11 and one worked for two. And like I'm literally part of the 1%. The turnover is 88% in the copier world uh, every six months. <laughs> it's not even for a year, right? Like it's a crazy thought. So the, the way that I did that though, is that I thought extremely outside of the box of every other single sales rep that I was competing against. I had 19 direct competitors and organizations. And sometimes as many as three total sales reps, like in one territory at each organization that I was up against. So you're talking about 30, 40 people in some instances calling on one account. And, and that person is going to be like very numb to the way that you're reaching out to them and trying to capture attention or gain any type of credibility or trust. And so again, like for me and in, in my playbook, direct mail is at the top. And really what it is for us is it's giving an experience, like rebels give experiences. So if in the strategy, it is less of, hey, I wanna pitch people my product and more of, I wanna give people a very unique, very intense, very emotionally driven, very curious experience that makes them think this person needs some attention from me. Not that they like owe it to us or have to give it to us, but that they, they like want to, and they need to, you know, those are completely different emotions. And that's what we're trying to drive. And if, if it's not up at the top, if it's not one of the most important things, then, you know, we're, we're, I guarantee you that you will not have as much success as you would, uh, you know, from the perspective of getting focusing more on like, where am I starting with individuals? Cause, and, let me just point out too, like for everybody in this call, I don't believe that's, that doing this suddenly like makes you the best sales rep out of the 40. But what it does do is it, it creates an emotion. Like right now you're indifferent as part of that 40 in the way that people think about you. But if you can create emotion, good or bad, everything changes. So even a bad reaction is good because if somebody's like, yeah, I really hated the watermelon that you sent me with the sledgehammer. I thought it was stupid. That it's like no one else got that email, ladies and gentlemen. No one else captured that attention. No one else turned heads in the office. No one else is on this person's radar at this point. Even if it's a restraining order, thank God you got one, you know, because then you can disqualify them really fast out of your system. But you, you guys get my point. It's really this the identity of me saying that it's so important is not to exaggerate it, 
or not to make it sound like ultimately it's the one thing that if you do, like you'll have more success than everybody else. It's really this idea of that it is extremely important to the way that people perceive us. And that's why it has to be at the top for me. I think, Dale, too, it, it's not only generating new business, right? But direct mail can be super powerful with opportunities that are active, right? So you have a demo and you get a, a handwritten note um, or you get something where, you know, I had a, a rep, for example, where a prospect got really, really sick and we sent them a gift card for, and this goes with the, the gifting too, a gift card for some chicken soup. Like, hey, no worries, you couldn't make the call. Go get yourself some soup and we'll be in touch when you're better. Take care of yourself. You know, so it brings that human element as well. And it all comes down to really caring and having purpose and that human to human connection. Yeah, direct mail for me, I mean, that's where I can use creativity the most. Um, I can create something novel, you know, something that someone hasn't seen before, uh, something that's pleasantly different uh, and new, uh, but also valuable. Um, and I think a lot of times in terms of sales, we think of valuable just being something relevant to their to their work day and their job or something like that. But uh, but there's also value in, you know, a little bit of entertainment uh, and a laugh that someone might get, uh, you know, that that emotional response that they have to the uh, uh, to the item that they're getting. Um, so so for me, that's what that's what direct mail allows me to uh, to do for not only other people, but also for myself, because uh, it's uh, it's enjoyable for me as well. Uh, and that's a huge part of it um, in my own sales walk. But then I'm going to jump in here and be that contrarian, as you know, we marketers tend to be sometimes because this scale, we're looking at creativity and efficiency. Is direct mail truly efficient as a person that's had to manage some of those campaigns? I can tell you not from my experience all the time. So does it still say in the S tier for creativity and efficiency? Yes. <laughs> Because the marketers will help, right? <laughs> well, okay. So I love this. I love your pushback. It's fantastic. And I, I think that there's two things to think about here. Number one is, is that if if we're looking at efficiency as this as this volume concept, then no, it's not. But is volume efficient is the real question is, is that I always come to, to the table with. Because if I have 20 people that are highly qualified to use my product, whether they're going to use it tomorrow or they're going to use it in five years from now. Because remember, I sold. Did you guys hear? I sold coffee machines for thirteen yeah, years. Really? So, so, <laughs> so average sales cycle was forty-two months. All right. So, if if I was just thinking about numbers all the time and like volume centric and bang, 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 but then you know, ultimately, like I would be losing track of some of those forty-two month cycles. But if I were to instead say, like, I'm going to figure out where these twenty people lie in their in their cycles, and I'm going to try and get their attention earn trust and credibility with them, create emotional context, give them an experience that they've never had before, then everything changes. Because now like of these 20 people, I'm like at that 50% mark right away, as far as like being A, being capable of being able to serve them, but B, them being extremely qualified to, to tap us and vice versa for us to serve them in this business relationship. That's what we need, you know? So if, to me, if it, efficiency is like, it's all con contextual, right? Like I, I see this as absolutely the most efficient because if I get on the phone and bang a thousand numbers out every day on my dialer and I talk to maybe three or four people a day in total and maybe set a couple of appointments, to me, that's not efficiency because there's 9,990 people left to get in touch with that are not, we're not getting any responses from, we're not creating any kind of outcome with. And, to, and again, like I, I look at that as hyper inefficient at the same time too. So, but to your point, like if I'm like packaging a bunch of six foot cardboard cutouts of myself and it takes four days for me to put that together, then yeah, that's like, there's a balance here for sure that like, we have to remember that like, even in sending that four day long you know, project that we had to put together that, at the, that ultimately like, it's not going to necessarily get a response. So we have to, we have to also walk into those same arenas with the understanding of being disconnected from the ultimate outcome and instead being very driven to stay the course. So I, I hope that I didn't sound like a madman just then, but that would be my two cents. Yeah, no, I, I appreciated like that. Sorry. 
Yeah, I, I like what Caleb said over here. Time to de- define efficiency, which was what Dale was getting at, right? But uh, uh, whenever we think about efficiency, it is that volume thing. And uh, the problem is that there's a lot of organizations and even you know leaders themselves that kind of want their human sales teams to be efficient like robots or machines. So when we, you know, when we think about uh, maximum efficiency, those are things that we, you know, those are tasks that we built machines or programs for. Um, but that's not really what, uh, you know, what humans are made for. So the issue becomes, you know, salespeople that are getting a lot of things done without it taking a ton of time, you know, automating a thousand emails or a dialer that makes 300 dials in 30 minutes. Um, but they're not getting a whole lot of results to, to show for it as the ever growing percentage of sales reps uh, that, that are missing quota shows. So, but if you ask a, a, a company owner or a sales letter, which one they would rather have, uh, if it's high efficiency without any results or low efficiency with results, um, they're you know probably going to honestly answer the latter. No, I love it because that gets to the heart of the issue. Are you efficient because you're doing more activity or are you efficient because the pipeline is moving faster? So with that spirit in mind, now that we've defined efficiency and what we're ultimately trying to do, um, let's go ahead and tackle gifting next. Uh, Jeremiah, uh, lead us off with that one. Where do you think gifting goes on this scale? Gifting on the scale of like uh, efficiency and uh, <clears throat> and creativity. Um, good question. <laughs> it, it really depends on your overall strategy. I mean, I would put it up there. Uh, gifting is usually um, reserved for for clients, though. I would say current clients um, is is usually the thought. Um, maybe maybe at a B. Yeah. Anybody agree with that? Yeah. Solid B, yeah. So yeah, the, like uh, B minus. And, and it's not that it can't work for cold outreach. It's just not something that we really uh, that we say, oh yeah, that's the, that's the way you want to do it. And and John Rulin, if you've ever you know read Giftology, is uh, you know he has the same uh, same idea. However, we do <laughs> we do have a rebel that uh, that sends personalized cutting boards as his like main maybe only thing that he does now as far as is that well not the only thing but his main thing uh as his outreach and he is one of the best reps in his company uh it is a gift uh there now there was of course messaging that uh that is relevant and, and things like that so there's more that goes into it but it could still be considered a gift it is valuable to the recipient um you know they they love it they tell them all the time how much they love the gift and so it's not that it can't be used uh, but you have to you have to use it very carefully, uh, I would say. So, ditto. All right, I love it. Okay, so then let's go on to our next one then, because uh, we've got oh my goodness six more of these to get through in our hour. So let's go ahead and tackle one that you guys mentioned a little earlier about calls. Um, Calling is never going to go away. So Dale, to your point, if you're sitting there making all of these dials, are we suddenly going to stop telling our sales teams to stop calling people? Probably not, but that doesn't mean that it has to be boring. Sam, where would you put uh, calls on yeah. this ranking system? I would put it, and I, I agree with Dale on, on this one, that we would put it down where like E, like I would say in between like EF, it has to be done, right? Mm -hmm. And to Dale's point too, around direct mail, right? I think it depends on your business. So at Sales Intel, for example, with the smaller organizations, like 30% of our deals are from cold calls. So it does work in some businesses, but it goes back to the tiering of accounts as well, because there's other really like high dollar potential that yes, direct mail, just getting a 5,000 person organization through the phone, probably not worth your time. Um, so it goes back to that balance. I don't think cold calling is ever going to go away. Um, but I, I I think like the EF mark is a, a good spot for it. Dale, Jeremiah, thoughts? Yeah, I, I so one thing that it's funny, like shout out to Jack Frimston, Benjamin, the UK's most hated sales trainer. Shout out to the homies that are on the phone all the time. These guys think I hate the phone. It's really funny because all I do is talk about, you know, creativity and sales. But 
And the phone is our best friend as sellers. And, and like, there's no better way than to get a hold of me than to like text me or send me or call me in a way that like catches my attention as well too. Like when we do a direct mail piece, that's awesome to these 20 people. And we have it sequenced to four touches, seven touches, 10 touches, whatever it is. Like there's phone calls in there and there's even emails in there. You know, they're just a lot more simplistic by nature. And also like if we have somebody's cell phone, we're not afraid as rebels to take a risk and send a text that, that's less like, hi, I'm Dale with the sales rebellion. We increase, you know, blah, 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 and do this, that, and the other. But instead of just like send a text that says like, hey, did you get that crumbled letter I sent them out? No name, nothing else. Just like, you got a crumbled letter. Like people look, pick up their phone and be like, oh, it's that crumbled letter guy. And and and, and be like, well, is it, yeah, is this a guy that sent it? You know? <laughs> like, how'd you get my number? You know, it doesn't really happen in those types of instances either is the thought process. Like people are more enthused and and open to what's happening in those moments. So really we look at the rec mail or like the giftology concept, even from that perspective is like first touch concepts or continuation concepts of the experience. Like the phone still has to be extremely well utilized throughout the process as well too. Otherwise, because yeah, the, the fruit is always in the follow-up, always, no matter what. Like, and so the phone is the best way to do that. And like, not every seller is living in their territories. You know, it's, it, Y'all would probably think we're crazy. Like we'll fly to a territory just to like literally go knock on a door and and drop off something and then call it later. You know, like that's we roll like that, right? But not everybody can do that. You know, it's it's it is a thing that like uh, Ariana was saying earlier. Like, is it efficient to do to do something like that? Like probably not. You know, but but I I still I think the phone is incredible. Like when I first started in my career and I was trying to even figure out my my crumbled letter methodology that I use as a sales rep or any of the crazy stuff that I did, I I still utilize the phone more than anything else. And even even back then, like email was was pretty hot to try. But man, I just always found it easier to to get somebody on the phone. And and ulti ultimately like if the phone isn't a phone tree, right? Then I think that like when you're tearing your accounts and you're figuring out your data and you're finding like, oh I have cell phones here or like people pick the phone up on the first dial. It's not a phone tree. Like these are the ways that you prioritize how to use the phone, even in those instances as well too. But, but where like, you know, in my head, I would, I like kind of uh, like punch the sky a little bit when Samantha was like, yeah, it's not really that important to me, the phone. Like at the same time I do, I would feel, I personally would feel like it's kind of in the middle there because, and really mostly just because of the follow-up methodology that's attached to it. And, and because that's still cold, you know, to an extent and it's consistency and it's like just understanding and making sure that we all recognize that like 90% of people have one of these that are human and, you know, in business. And, and even if it's a flip phone still, cause a lot of my Jewish friends still have like flip phones. I'm, I, it's awesome. Shout out to all my Jewish friends. And uh, they're, they're, they're incredible in the way that they like do not jump to technology on their phones, but they freaking have like the latest software. And <laughs> it's amazing. Anyway, I don't know how y'all do it, but anyway, so the idea again, is like, if I can dial a number and there's a person on the other side, then I'm humanizing my approach. I, I would say this too, like uh, Samantha said, like make it creative. Like it's very easy to be creative on the phone. Like all y'all, are probably thinking to yourself like, well, yeah, like creativity would be a pattern interrupt. Like, hey, this is a phone call. Do you want to throw the, you know, the your device out the window and scream, or do you want to hear what I have to to sell? And like, we would look at it like this, like that same rep that Jeremiah was talking about earlier that sends a cutting board. If 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 he's calling Hannah and Hannah picks up the phone, hello, this is Hannah. Like, there's no reason on a phone call to not just give an experience right from the get go. There's no there's no point in saying like, hey, Hannah, it's it's Dale how are you? You know, like those are nice things. But if instead I was like, Hannah, as an HR professional, and I were to just like tell a quick story on Mondays, usually when you get into the office, these are three things that happen. And I were to make it like a 12 to 15 second talk track and then say, by the way, this is Dale, the guy that sent you that cutting board. Then I'm, I'm creating again, like a moment and experience efficiency and the way that I'm communicating and it, be, and it takes like, again, it takes the phone like up a notch for me just a little bit. So there's, I keep jumping on these soap boxes. You're going to be so mad at me for taking eight minutes every time I talk. And I apologize. I'll start <laughs> lashing myself to stop or, or I won't. Who knows? <laughs> I'll just tell Eduardo to mute you and we will move on. Just kidding. No, I want to, I want to hear the perspectives. I want to know what's going on. But what I heard even there is maybe we, we would move this up into like a C tier of, it needs to happen. It can be efficient if it's done right and how you're doing your targeting. Um, but it's not necessarily the thing that's going to get you closer to the deal. 
necessarily. Everyone agree with that? Are we moving it up or are we going to keep it down there? I'd move it up. As someone who calls but primarily uses direct mail to uh, to better use the phone um, and not just with a dial, uh, which is an important thing that Dale said. Uh, we don't use the phone just to dial. Um, it's extremely important because I want to use that direct mail to create a direct conversation on the phone uh, with somebody is really is really the goal. Um, because more than likely that person is probably not going to, even though I've got my phone number on the letter, they're probably not going to pick up their phone and call me. It does happen sometimes, but I want them, I want to create an experience for whenever I call them, uh, or send them a text or whatever for them to want, uh, to talk to me because it is different. Um, I stay anonymous in some of my touches, uh, so that when I follow up with people, whether it's email or phone, uh, I can say, Hey, I'm the guy who you know, sent you this. And it, it creates a lot of curiosity when I stay anonymous uh, because they have to know like mm -hmm. who's, who's even sent me this thing, right? And so it, it makes that phone call a whole lot easier. No, absolutely. So then let's move on to our next topics. We've got about 30 minutes left. So we've got, um, let's look at social selling and like community. So building community, but then also I think there's a, a line of this that goes in to sales professionals building their own personal brands and usually how we would think about that traditionally now is all of the b2b SaaS community is leaning in community and leading into brand we see sales professionals starting to do this as well so um jeremiah i'm going to hand it back to you to quickly pick one social community or a brand and then tell me where it goes on this and why uh so let's go social social community being not social selling though is what you're saying sorry did I hear that right? Yeah, social selling, like you're okay. you're selling on social media, you're selling into your community, you're trying to leverage your community to get your pipeline to move. Gotcha, okay. Well, personal brand, I would say it's gotta be up there. I mean, mostly because we got the leader of the rebellion on this call right now, and he's you know primarily built this business through his personal brand on LinkedIn. Uh, so it's gotta be up there, right? Um, and so I, I'd put it at, man, I, I'd put it at the top. Sam, what do you think about that? Um, so I, ag I, I agree. I, I feel like in order to be successful in sales, though, you don't necessarily need to have a stellar personal brand, right? And I think right now, oh, I, I know, Dale, Dale. Um, but I know <laughs> it's social. That is where buyers are. That is where you can get people. You can get to know people. You can get people to know you. I think it's really important, but I don't think you need to master it to be successful in sales. So I would still keep it up there, but I think I would do it more like a B. That's a good point. I think it depends on who you're selling to, right? There's well, a lot of people that probably aren't even on social. So that's a really good point. So then Dale, what about this other side of this? Because being a personal brand, how do you really get that out there? Yes, you talked about doing it through direct mail, but not every salesperson or every team is gonna have budget tools, resources to be able to do that. So then they do it through social media. How do you think that relates to personal brand and content? And where would you put social selling and community on this, uh, this ranking? Great question. Let me start with the, I love what you just said there actually sparked some things that went to my head really quick that will, should be very helpful for everybody listening. One is, is that you talked about like budget. So back when I was selling, did you, did you guys know? So like I, I was selling copiers. So, so when I first started and I was just, really, really now? when I first started and I was real, and I was trying to figure out how to do this level of marketing, like how do I get, how do I be different? How do I grab people's attention more effectively? I don't have thousands of dollars i just want everybody to hear this that like i made uh i think my checks were 250 dollars a week um which was a draw i was commission only basically so i made a 250 dollar draw that i owe back to the company and i couldn't take more than three months of draw before i like wasn't getting paid anymore and so i lived in this world where it was like re results are nothing and i had no money I, I I mean we missed eight mortgage payments, like almost lost everything. Like, like we have the story, right? It was it was crazy time. 
And, and I said to myself, I'm not going to let that hinder me. So I spent uh, no money, basically just like dollars and cents to print letters or draw and write letters, <laughs> you know, on like legal pads that I took from like the office supplies <laughs> and, and like use those for my, my direct mail marketing or my experiences. So I, and I look at social the same way. You don't have to be this big flashy thing. You don't have to be this like perfectly put together brand. You just have to have the right heart. You just have to have, you have to take the right measures. You have to think about the right audience. You have to, to, to be efficient, <laughs> if you will, in this whole process. See what I did there? It was pretty good. So I, you guys are going to have me back for another webinar. I can feel it in my bones. So, so, so then give me a letter, Dale. Where does this go? Which letter? What are you? What are you talking? What are you talking so, about? Are you trying to catch me in the chart? chart? On the chart. Oh on the chart, God. man. Where this does chart. it go? Me and Samantha are having a private conversation about this chart right now. By the way, I think, I think that, I, I think that it goes in. And look, like I'm super biased. I have huge following. I've made millions off my personal brand. I, I, I'm biased, right? Like I, I think that what Samantha said is really spot on though. And I think what Jeremiah was saying also is extremely important. So I think that for everyone in this room, it's for them to decide. And so I put it right in the middle that either it goes up or it goes down for you as a, as a rep based on your target market and ultimately what you're trying to achieve. And let me hit personal brand real quick one more time, because Samantha made a great point about uh, like the social side, social selling side of the personal brand. But remember that you don't have to be super active on social to have a personal brand. So whenever I first started as a rebel student, because that's how I started in the rebellion, um, I created a personal brand without doing much social posting. And when Dale was the copier warrior, when he first started as the copier warrior and built that personal brand, I don't even think, did LinkedIn even exist? Uh, you definitely weren't posting on it every day like you are now. So, uh, so we don't only have to think of personal brand as strictly being an online thing. Uh, as well. We can keep it a B, but I just wanted to make that point. <laughs> Great point. No, I like it be because then you're you're being honest. And I also appreciate, Dale, just the mindfulness of the personalized brand really works for you, but it may not work for someone else because, and again, like being your, your brand doesn't mean that you're having to be someone else that you're not. It's showing up as who you are authentically. And that's what's really working right now. And let's let's touch on that a little bit more into Piper personalization because I've I've been in the space long enough. Um, whenever it comes to your content, and I've heard people say, "Oh no, hyper per, 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 ugh, personalization." I can say it is bad. I can't control what my reps say. They're gonna say anything. Then you have um, hyper personalization is great. It allows some flavor. It allows perspective. So then where? Where in that conversation of being, again, creative while still being efficient, should hyper-personalization land? Sam, I'm going to give that one to you. Assuming I'm finally understanding this chart, I am going to say that hyper-personalization should be at the very bottom because our, our goal, right, is to get attention. It's to bring light that we can help solve common challenges that our buyers have, no matter what you sell. And a lot of the time I see hyper-personalization gone wrong, where it's like, oh, you're in New Jersey and you went to school here and you have a daughter and this and this. And it's like, that has nothing to do with my problems. Like that's noise to me. So I think there's too much time being spent on hyper-personalization, where if they did send a crumpled letter or they did send a very custom video message, human to human, that's going to catch the attention of me. And it's going to, you're going to tell me like how you can help solve some common problems that I'm likely facing. Uh, so I, I think I'm right that this is at like an EF. Thoughts? I'll go. Eduardo, <laughs> get ready. Um, yeah, I think you're right. I think people people do take way too much time. I think this is the thing is, is that it's so much easier to just like find something epic. Like we had a student at Google that uh, he he basically he said I asked him. I just said, hey, in in literally thirty seconds or less, 
I want you to figure out what you know about this person. And he sends me all this stuff and I'm so, and I respond back to him and go like, none of this is really that relevant though. Agreed. He says, yes. I say 30 more seconds, try it again, do it like this. He comes back and says this, this, and this, because really what hyper-personalization is about is not just understanding like that, like Samantha said that somebody's children went to these colleges or that they like this sport. It's about like an experience. It's about something they love. It's about something that like they're passionate about more than it is like about, you know, the person, right? Because I can find anybody's birthday if they have a voting record, you know, like it's kind of easy to find that stuff at the end of the day. But the, like, what is something that would be that wouldn't be thought of? And a good way to look at this, too, is, is that so I saw a rep recently that that sent out a uh, he was saying, I'm going to send out a New York Yankees hat to this guy because he's a New York Yankee fan. And I was like, do you think this dude doesn't have a New York Yankees hat, bro? Like, that's that's not smart. So instead, we send him a New York Mets T-shirt and put an X through it. I was like, he doesn't have that one. Like, that's not even in existence. And he'll freaking love that, right? So when you go back to the Google guy, what he did was he he found this guy loved to go to Germany. And it's part of, like, his heritage. He finds an old German recipe for, like, a piece of bread that, like, I can't even pronounce. Puts a grandmother's German recipe book together, like, customizes it, sends it to this person, lands a $2.7 million deal. That is where... The, the hyper customization, personalization, if you will, comes into play, but nobody does it that way, which is why I think that the, the topic itself has to be put very low, because if we put it high and you and you're not an understanding of like what it actually means and what you're truly trying to accomplish, it will be a time suck and it will literally hurt your sales existence. Yeah, I agreed. The definition is really important there. <laughs> We can't think of hyper personalization as taking a few tidbits and putting them into an email uh, or, or message on you know some some other platform uh, or other medium, and think that we're you know really creating some uh, some unique experience for someone uh, like you just said. Although, wouldn't we send them a Red Sox T-shirt with the X rather than the Mets? I mean, like the Mets and the uh, okay, that's all I'm saying. <laughs> I don't know about enough about baseball to mediate that one for you guys. Uh, but I do hear what you're saying about how personalization, it can actually work against you. So I was actually, to be honest, I was expecting that one to be higher, but I loved where you guys put this as it can actually be a detriment to you if you're not doing it correctly. So make sure that if you're going to put the effort in, that you really make it creative and you're making it creative in the other areas that you guys have already touched on. So now let's, let's go to video messages next. We'll save good old email for last. Um, we'll go to video messages next. Um, Dale, why don't you take that one very briefly? Where where should video message rank on terms of efficiency and creativity? This one goes in the middle for me too, like a B or a C, somewhere in that in that in that range. Just because there's a again, there's a a it's a really, really unique way to prospect. It's very uh, the outcomes are always very, very, very high in positive responses. Um, even if you get like bad news, like it's still like a hey, great effort. I really appreciated that, right? So it's it's definitely something to help build relationships, if you will, and and again create trust, provide credibility, help people even with this identity of who you are, ultimately what you're trying to accomplish for this person instead of you know like what you want to sell them, right? There's a lot of good to it, but it. It goes in the middle for me because it also can be like a complete and total time suck for some people. And at the same time, too, that it can be a box that people check like, oh, I just did a meeting, so I need to send this video. And then they shoot it like eight times because they're like, oh, I forgot to mention like this one thing or you know, like it, it, it really can just get muddy. But but what I like just to point it out real quick, too, for anybody watching, it's like. Yeah, well, what would you do? Like, well, two things. One is like, I really just like shooting a video and hitting go and never watching it even. Like, even if I screwed it up, I'll never know. And and then I also really love voice notes. So if I can do like a voice note to somebody over text, over email, over LinkedIn, whatever it is, like after something has a recap or in the prospecting phase to some capacity, I think that it's much more efficient. It can be seconds instead of minutes. There's less processing, less copy and pasting. You know, it's just very simple. But but again, I think that ultimately it falls in the middle for me. But please, if somebody wants to disagree, go for it. I agree. And I also agree with that. Just send it. 
just send it. If you messed up your words, you clicked on the wrong thing, you did something, just send it um, because you're human. The, the purpose of the video is not to be perfect at all. And you're going to save a ton of time if you just record your video and send it. Um, I think you put it in a, a beautiful spot. Yeah, I think you should actually include your blooper reel at the end. <laughs> Please. It's very rebellious. <laughs> We actually had one of those for a, a fun like holiday campaign that we did. I had a bunch of people saying different stuff and I showed the blooper reel and it actually got more engagement. So there's something about just being a human and flubbing sometimes that just makes you more enjoyable to watch because it's it's relatable. It's you understanding people trying to do this on the back end as well. All right, let's let's touch on emails next and then we'll get to some questions. We've had a lot of questions. I see that you are amazing speakers have been answering some of them in the chat. Um, but I want to get time to make sure that we can dig into those a little bit more as well. Jeremiah, last one, good old email, email marketing, email sequencing, also not going away, also can be creative, also can get caught in spam. Where does that go on the ranking for you? Ah, uh, emails is such a crap shoot these days. I'm going to put, <laughs> I'm going to put it pretty low. Um, on the uh, on the scale here, <clears throat> I'm gonna go with man. It's E or F. It's pretty low for me. Ooh, put it down here. You can still create an experience for someone over email. It's just very difficult because the inbox is so noisy from so many other people that even creating uh, an experience um, gets lost just in the sheer volume. Uh, and that makes it difficult. Deliverability, like you just mentioned too, uh, Ariana, is, is, a, is an issue that people struggle with as well. Um, and more and more rules are always coming out, uh, governing emails and deliverability and, and things like that. So, so for me, that's why it, you know, it ranks down low on the list. Even though we're still gonna do it, we're still gonna try to be creative or uh, we're still going to be creative and as creative as possible and try to create those experiences. But, but yeah, th those are the reasons why I'd rank it low. Perhaps that's why hyper personalization and email are on the same line. Yeah. And I, I would say too, with the email, it's not, it's not going to be effective standalone, right? Will it help in maybe as additional touches in any of these other methods? that we talked about, of course. Um, but if you're looking to just email, like you're you're not spending your time chips well. Well, again, this is why we tie it to direct mail, right? So if we can, if I can stay anonymous on a direct mail touch and then put a subject line as uh, the guy who sent you the cutting board or cutting board or a crumpled letter or whatever it might be, um, you know, related to that direct mail piece, then that can get some attention and that can stand out. Um, not always, but, uh, but it's got, way more of a shot uh, than if I hadn't sent them anything before him. I can, I can throw with awesome. everything that's been said. I think it goes low. And I mean, this would be like where you go back to if you have built a personal brand and you have a community of people and like a 60, 70% open rate across the board for, you know, 5,000 plus people, then it's easier to communicate with those people than, than it is just, just like email poll. So I think there's a strategy for it, but I think it's a long game. And I think it's really cultivating like this identity of people opening the emails over and over again and like being happy with what they're reading and looking at and finding value in those things and and then offering them, you know, crumbled letter campaigns or courses or whatever you're trying to do. But it's a it's a commitment because you now right now, like look at the world, like the world of sales is insane. And, you know, people are now coming out and saying, like, it's very normal to have like 18 domains to send your emails from because of how easy it is for your emails to go into spam. That's a crazy thought. So I would I would just be careful if I'm a person that's sitting here like relying on email 500 plus a day kind of thing just to like hear back from somebody. You're not cultivating anything with people through email. You're not building relationships. You're not helping to see for people to see like what you fix and how you help and serve in the first place you're just asking for 15 minutes and you know saying something crazy that josh braun taught you shout out to josh braun great guy 
<laughs> I love where you're calling that out, Dale, because it's not just did is the email correct? Like you can find the correct email. There are tools out there that help you do that, but it's what you do with it. Are you adding value to the inbox? Are you sending emails that aren't personalized correctly? And now it's just noise. And this is where email is a channel. It's still going to continue to be one, just like calls is one that uh, SaaS is going to use, but it's all about how do we use it more effectively? How do we look at now this whole picture that we've created of what is going to help you stand out and be very creative versus what are things that can help support that if you're doing it together so let's let's keep this view up while we go through some of our questions because maybe they'll tr they'll trigger something and we'll move some stuff around um we have a lot of questions around direct mail as well um i think we'll go directly to tom you've got a great question in here of can you give examples of direct mail materials and sequence so what can you send and how does that work with all of the other touches that you can do? Yeah, so we like to do campaigns. Um, you know, there's there's lots of one off things that you could do, uh, but that kind of falls a lot of times in the in the line of uh, uh, what someone would consider a gimmick or something like that. So we've mentioned the crumpled letter. I actually have one right here as well. It's in a little trash can. Uh, so sometimes we send them in envelopes. Sometimes we send them in little trash cans like this. The letter is crumpled up when you send it in a trash can. It's just in a in a crumpled ball. Uh, so they're going to have to un you know uncrumple that and read the letter. And so that's an example of the crumpled letter that we've been talking about. But there are six other letters as well. So if we send them a crumpled letter and they don't respond to our email and phone and social follow ups. Well, I've got another, I've got a coffee stain letter coming, uh, you know, behind that. Uh, there's the the relevant uh, uh, emote or the relevant experience as far as like, hey, we know you get a lot of stuff. And so we sent this uh, to you uh, for you to use it as a coffee coaster or we pre-shredded it uh, for you and things like that. Um, so it, it, uh, it really creates some emotional context around that. Um, but we like to use a lot of campaigns that... Uh, that aren't necessarily building off of each other, um, you know, to where it doesn't, they don't have to have gotten the crumpled letter for the coffee letter to make sense or something like that. Um, but, uh, uh, but, but yeah, still like in the same vein uh, as far as that goes, if that makes sense, hopefully. Yeah, I would just add to it that like, so a lot of like what's popular right now uh, in a lot of circles is send cookies. Um, and by the way, sending someone crumble cookies, like you're a cool person for sure. Those are delicious cookies. The, the problem that we see with it is that it's, it is, it's like a bribe to an extent, right? It's the thought process. So people talk about gimmicks being bad, like, well, what about bribes? Or like, hey, you know, I gave you some sugar, so like give me some back, which can be like extremely misconstrued messaging as well too. So it, it, it like makes it look like you want a favor. It's not good. And, and, and look, like, I'm not saying you shouldn't do that, but like, here's an idea. We send empty cookie boxes and we put notes in them with crumbs everywhere that say, Hey, I've been trying to get a hold of you and I haven't heard back. So I had to eat these cookies. They were going stale, but you know, if you ever want to holler at your boy, we could maybe set something up and share some of these. And uh, like the idea here, especially with what Jeremiah is saying, is like, make it relevant create emotional context, take a stereotype, a negative one in most cases are easy to find, like of the industry, of sales, of the vertical there and manufacturing, aerospace, whatever it is, and like create a very experiential, highly motivating moment for them to be like, this is clever. This person has business acumen. They understand my organization to some capacity, the things I deal with on a daily basis. Like this is what we want to send in the mail. So Paper is easy, y'all. Like just to say, like it's easy to send. We have a seven-letter sequence in the Rebel Letter campaign that we send. We have a postcard sequence, even that we're just finished putting together that we send. It's easy. It gets the mail easy. It's inexpensive, and it's a massive uh, interrupt to the typical patterns of the way that people are traditionally called on. And it's powerful because of that. But you got to remember all the elements that come with this as well, too. So don't just like send a back scratcher and tell somebody you can reach the hard to get places in their business and fix their problems. Like that's just weird. Right. But instead like provide something that is very motivating and it, it, it pushes toward the topic of what it is that you fix, how you can help or the type of scenarios that you're running into with this person, like ghosting, which is our favorite. <laughs> Another good example uh, to, to what Dale is saying is, uh, is the unwritten story campaign that we have. So we'll send a book uh, that is a cover with the, uh, the, 
the prospect as the author um, and us as the co-author. And it talks about the story that we can write together. If only we would meet and have a conversation and, uh, and of course, them, you know, doing business uh, with us in the future. Uh, and we have a whole campaign attached mm-hmm. to that. You know, if they, if we don't get a response uh, from them, then there's a, there's a bookmark and then there's a, a future newspaper article that, that goes with that. So, uh, so these are touches that, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's not a gift card or anything like that. It, it's not a bribe. It's, uh, it's really just trying to paint a future picture of what it would be like to work together. So mm-hmm. I would say direct mail is really only I think- limited to your creativity and your budget. <laughs> And I think that touches on a really great question that we had here from Jordan. And we'll make this the last question before we have to wrap up for today. But he had mentioned how his boss was saying that before gifting can make you look desperate. And if you guys had any recommendations for the objections, but I think you've touched on this a little bit. Um, Sam, is there anything that you would add to that one specifically? Yeah, I think where gifting really shines is post deal closed and customer relationships. And it's with the foundation of gratitude like truly appreciating their business, truly appreciating their time. It's You got to take yourself out of the equation. You're not expecting anything in return from sending this gift, right? It's appreciation. So I think the best time for gifting is post-sale, maybe working towards the close for all of the help that they've given you like throughout this process and then also customer relationships. Awesome. Well, thank you all so much for sharing your insights as we go through that fun exercise. You can take it and look at it and try to understand where are you can where you can spend a lot of creativity, what's going to make you truly efficient in your pipeline, not just hitting those volume numbers, but then also understanding which of those elements when you're trying to be creative can actually work against you. So thank you so much for your time and your expertise. We've had an amazing chat. Y'all have been great at asking amazing questions. Awesome. Yeah, I agree. Thank you, speakers. Uh, can everyone hear me? Okay. Thank you, speakers, for uh, the insights. I saw that the audience really enjoyed. Uh, audience, thank you so much. You're the best part of MSP. Uh, I saw someone asking for the final uh, layout of the ranking here, so I'm going to add that to my uh, follow-up email. Uh, thank you all so much for participating. That was a lot of fun. Thank you all for the questions. Um, if you liked what the speakers discussed today, I think like before you go to all these channels, you need quality data, right? And Skills Intel can offer that. So just click the request a demo uh, with our sponsor button at the top of this page and Sales Intel team will get in touch with you later today and you can see the magic happening. Um, speakers, Ariana, Sam, Jeremiah, and Dale, thank you so much for coming. Uh, Dale, I'm so happy that I didn't have to meet you today, um, but thank you so much. Next time, uh, I will be more attentive. Audience, I'll see you in the next event. And as I mentioned, we might be coming to a city near you, so keep an eye out in our schedule. Um, and while the speakers and I hang out backstage, the MSP team will make sure that you, audience, receive the video for this uh, webinar and also the key takeaways and the final uh, layout of the Uh, ranking right there. So speakers, we can go hang out backstage. Audience, thank you so much for your questions and participation today. See you next time.